Welcome everyone, good morning, and welcome to today's Meeting of the Minds webinar. Today we're going to be discussing adapting payment systems to new mobility solutions. My name is Jesse feller -Hahn. I'm the Executive Director of Meeting of the Minds. We're a global thought leadership network and platform with year-round digital and in-person programming. Our mission is to connect global urban sustainability, innovation, and technology leaders across sectors to share best practices, tools, and solutions. We do that through our blog, cityminded.org our monthly webinar series, pop-up events and workshops, meetups, and conferences. So today we have two presenters. Boris Karsh is Vice President for Strategy at Cubic Transportation Systems. He leads the execution of Cubic's next city vision for the integration of payment and information systems with direct responsibility for strategy development partnerships and acquisitions. Matthew Hudson is Head of Business Development and Transport for London. He has led the £1 billion procurement of the Fair Collection Services contract and has acted as policy lead for fair collection in Europe, among many other responsibilities. So I will pass the ball to Boris. Boris, take it away. Great, thank you, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, so from an agenda point of view, uh, the way we're, Matthew and I are hoping to approach the seminar is uh, we're gonna talk through some of the observations we have on the changing mobility environment and the challenges this creates, uh, particularly for cities that are trying to service increasing population uh, in an environment of rapid technology change, and then use some uh, case studies from London, Chicago, and Miami to bring some of those topics to light. Um, as per Jesse's introduction, yeah, we very much look forward uh, to dive deeper into those uh, issues and questions with you together uh, during the question and answer session. So we'll try to keep the introduction slides uh, very much to the point to give everybody an opportunity to ask questions and for us together to explore the topic uh, in more detail. So welcome again and with that um, uh, I'll hand over to Matthew, who will you know, start us on this journey um, by uh, talking about the, uh, the changes in transportation and get us into the mindset uh, for this webinar. Thank you, Boris, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, I just wanted to share something that has happened in TFL in the last 12 months as we uh, look forward and try to think of the future challenges. And I think the future challenge, which is uh, represented in the sort of bottom right-hand corner rather poorly, I think, on this slide, is around this new world of connected, uh, autonomous, shared vehicles. And I'm sure everyone in the audience um, is aware of this and is thinking about this. But what struck us in London when we did our analysis was how this is going to fundamentally affect the economics of transport. And what we did was to try to examine sort of the cost base of um, these shared vehicles um, and almost work through where we will end up. And I just want to share, I'm sure many of you already got there, but the three changes that are taking place is with the autonomous um, vehicle, we will be removing the cost of the driver from driving a car. So if we compare this to a taxi or a hire vehicle, that's 60% of the cost being taken out by the driver. Um, we've then got the issue that ownership models of cars may well change, such that um, individuals don't own cars, but they are owned by companies or shared ownership and will be m used more intensely. And finally, um, we're looking at models, or we understand models, where um, rides will be shared, which again will have a big impact on cost. And the best way, I think, to bring this to light for us in London was that we've recently launched uh, a nighttime tube service uh, on the underground where trains are running every 15 minutes on some of our lines and we're charging people a standard fare of £2.40 to use that service. And we wonder in the future, in a world of shared autonomous vehicles, when uh, that vehicle can probably pick you up from outside your restaurant and take you home to your door um, with little congestion on the roads, for maybe a, a fraction of the cost, maybe a pound, maybe less than a pound, our business model is going to be fundamentally challenged um, in this space, and we have to start reacting to it. So that's one of the observations that I've seen, and I want to touch on it later, but um, for the rest of you there, you can try and work out the previous seven uh, transport revolutions uh, just to set the scene. 
but I'll, I'll hand back to Boris. Great, thank you, Matthew. Uh, so, you know, just expanding a little bit on the point that Matthew made. Yeah, I think we all on this call recognise that we're in a period of very significant change, right? So even just if we look at what's happening today and in the recent years, you know, we've seen a big increase in um, investment, bringing new modes of transportation uh, to cities. Uh, you know, if we look at ride-sharing companies, uh, shared car services, bike share schemes, etc. But at the same time, we've also seen other changes putting pressure on um, congestion, road usage in cities, and, and, and that's really our uh, increased shift from you know, physical shopping to online shopping that you know, adds uh, freight as another much more significant dimension um, to everyday usage. At the same time, if you look at you know, the personal experience, the user experience side, um, we're seeing the introduction of uh, digital technologies that are transforming the user experiences through mobile. Um, a particular uh, you know, private industry is leading the way in terms of um, you know, educating uh, consumers of public transportation service of what's possible with digital technology. So one of the challenges all of our customers are working on is how do they, as, uh, as government, uh, keep up with you know, what is a fairly rapidly changing environment. And then as Matthew said, uh, as we move into an autonomous future, yeah, the economics will drastically change. Uh, so the summary of the, all of that is that yeah, all of our customers um, are similar to Transport for London, thinking about what's the future role of the city in this environment, uh, you know, how should technology investment decisions uh, be made in order to deal with is you know, a fast-changing environment. So, uh, you know, if, if we then um, you know, kind of dig into that a bit more, at the same time we've got um, uh, users that are changing. You know, um, you know, we talked about uh, the mobile becoming a, a dominant uh, information portal for people in terms of how they receive and how they want to transact uh, and the digital experiences that uh, consumers are expecting. But at the same time, we have an aging population that uh, will have uh, different constraints on transportation, so perhaps uh, less able uh, to drive themselves in some areas, have different mobility and access needs. Uh, and we have a younger generation that is almost demanding uh, more of a public transportation type model um, you know, to enable the digital connectivity and you know, place less of an emphasis on personal ownership of cars. Uh, so if we then uh, dig into that from a, yeah, what are some of the challenges that we see um, cities talk about for the future? We really see there's, there's three main areas. Uh, one of them is governance and policy. Um, you know, to manage the future transportation network um, that now consists of a mix, a much bigger mix of uh, private and public modes of transportation, a need to break down uh, the silos between uh, different modes. So a good example, uh, leading back to Matthew's comment on autonomous vehicles, uh, you know, there's really a need to find a way to manage road usage and uh, payments uh, together, uh, for example, to avoid a situation where it's cheaper for an autonomous vehicle to simply circle in a city and use up space uh, versus encouraging the same vehicle to park in a underutilized uh, part of the urban infrastructure uh, in order to free up the mobility space for um, you know, the transport of people and, um, and goods. Um, yeah, similarly, um, you know, the sensor data that traditionally has been collected by roads authorities around traffic movement, safety cameras, etc. Uh, now need to be integrated into uh, things like uh, trip planning tools that give people uh, meaningful uh, instructions on what the current situation is in an urban environment and encourage different travel behaviors. So all of that translates at a government and policy uh, point of view a need to become more coordinated on a regional level uh, and remove some of the traditional silos. Um, you know, similarly, on the future services and delivery model, um, 
I think there's an opportunity to mix and match um, service delivery um, more. So, you know, so some of the questions our customers ask themselves is, you know, what should be the the role of a government agency in terms of uh, being, you know, a, a planning organisation, a service arranging organisation versus a service delivery organisation that actually operates uh, certain transportation services and yeah, we're clearly seeing different models evolving in different parts of the world, um, uh, but particularly the need to bring some of the private modes of transportation into the overall mobility system. Yeah, we expect that debate, and that perhaps is a, is a great area to talk about when we're in the question and answer session. And then similar on the technology side, um, I think one of the consequences we see about um, the um, uh, the, the rapidly changing environment is that um, flexibility is, is going to be critical. I think uh, it, it's probably dangerous for any one of us to predict how quickly and how fast and in what very specific direction uh, technology will change, but we are seeing a, a massive acceleration in technology change. So t to us that means um, cloud-based uh, models that make it easier to scale, uh, become more important, um, open interfaces and open data become more important to enable the integration of uh, new technologies and services into the um, mobility payment infrastructure uh, more rapidly than today. But also, we also see a need for procurement models to change. Um, you know, if you look at uh, traditional procurement models, it may take up five years from inception to specification to procurement to delivery of new technology, which you know, is, is clearly slower uh, than the rate of technology change, particularly in the area of digital technology like mobile. Um, so this, these are some of the challenges, and I'd like to invite Matthew you know, to um, you know, expand on that perhaps from a Transport for London um, perspective and then take us through the yeah. London study to expand on some of those points. Yeah, thank, thank you, Boris. I, I think when I look on this particular slide and the items that Boris has raised, I need to share with the audience that on the sort of the governance issue, um, London is in quite a lucky position. Um, I work for Transport for London. We are responsible for all the buses in London. We run the tube network, our light rail network, and we're responsible for managing 20% of the roads and all of the traffic lights. And not only that, but we also, under our mayor, um, have links through to planning powers in terms of land use planning. So while we have achieved many things in London, um, we've done it from a position of strength uh, in terms of governance that's allowed us to achieve these models. But there are some interesting challenges for us in that you know, our objective, as written in law, is to integrate transport and provide integrated transport to Londoners, not necessarily run all transport. And I think as we start seeing these new models come out, you know, one of the challenges for us is to remember why we're here, what our reason is here, and how we do adapt to these new models. And I will be honest to say um, it is a live debate here in London. Um, there was a recent report issued last week from uh, a party suggesting that road user charging uh, it's time had come for London as a way of addressing the congestion. Now, those sort of radical ideas are being um, aired, uh, and as yet we don't have um, a decision on the best way forward. When I look at the um, delivery models, again, I think it's worth sharing with the audience that um, what we've done in London is we've used our size um, to deliver some services uh, ourselves. You know, I have a technical development team of 150 people. Um, and that has allowed us to do some of the innovative things and move things forward. Um, uh, and, and that's been an advantage for London, to hopefully just show the way um, for places, uh, other people to move uh, and follow. And I think finally, looking at technology, um, I have always been told that um, in terms of technology, absolutely anything's possible. Um, one of the real constraints is the commercial. And one of the things I'll talk about later is some of the commercial constraints that uh, we are under to make uh, affordable deals uh, work. What I wanted to do was just to take the audience, uh, if we look at the next slide, um, 
just through our experience in London around uh, ticketing, just as an example of um, how we've worked. Obviously, we've worked with uh, Cubic as our partner uh, and what we've managed to deliver. And I just want to start with a very short history lesson, which is that once upon a time on the buses, people paid with cash. There was no such thing as a ticket. And the reason that was a problem was because of fraud. Too much money was being taken by conductors. You can see in my photo, the conductor there has a cigar and a top hat that he's managed to make from all the money that he has fraudulently taken. And what we find is in the 1880s, uh, the picture on the right shows you cutting edge technology, which is the uh, metal uh, case that is hanging around the conductor's uh, shoulder. And the issuing of a paper ticket to a customer was a business process that was introduced in order to stop fraudulent travel. And when we looked at this, uh, when we looked about London, we realized from that particular starting point, of the need for having a ticket, um, we've done lots of development in that business process to make it better. So if we just look on the next slide as some of the examples, we've developed um, machines you can operate with one hand, we've developed tickets um, that are more innovative, so available for a whole day's travel, we've tried automated checking on buses with turnstiles, we have automatic machines selling tickets, we have automatic gates checking tickets. But all of this has been built around the premise of a customer having to buy a ticket in order to access the transport system. And what we started in London, which we were uh, certainly taking the lead from Hong Kong on the Octopus card, was when we launched our Oyster card, we realized that um, a pay-as-you-go product for customers, where they paid for their single journeys from value on their card, was a very popular uh, way of paying. And I think our original forecast were there would be 300,000 people who would regularly use pay as you go, uh, and we're now at 8.6 million using pay as you go. And we've introduced daily capping for that service, and what we have found is actually our preferred method and our most equitable method for accessing transport is pay as you go. And that is the, the method that we wish to promote in London above all others. Um, I think deep down there is a desire to see the end of heavily discounted annual and monthly tickets because they no longer have a business sense. And once we arrived at the idea of pay-as-you-go as the correct answer for our customers, in some respects it was a short jump to move to contactless bank cards or even uh, contactless mobile wallets um, as another way of paying because again it would just take money from someone's account um, and they would pay for their single journeys and capped at a daily amount. And in fact, for bank cards, we've been able to cap a weekly amount as well uh, to add benefits to our customers. Now, one of the things that we in London spent a lot of time doing when we launched um, the new bank card system was around communicating to our customers. And I have some examples of the posters here, of which I think the most interesting uh, is the one on the left-hand side. Um, which was a new phrase we invented called card clash, where sometimes a contactless bank card and a Oyster card would almost interfere and the customer wouldn't be able to use them. But this was a message that we gave incessantly for six months, and it was the only message we really had to give to our customers. Everything else was designed to be simply used. They didn't have to register. It was the same fares. It was very easy to use but we made absolutely sure that our customers were very, very clear on how to use the product before it was launched. And I can't help but um, put up some slides of uh, graphs showing the success. So you can see here the journeys per day used on this contactless technology that's now been around for just over two years. Um, and in that just over two years, 40% uh, of the addressable market has switched from a stored value card of Oyster through to contactless either on bank card or on mobile wallet. And mobile wallets are about 7% of the totals you see there. In fact, the next slide is possibly even more uh, impressive, which is the number of new cards or mobile wallets we see every day. So you can see there's a fairly steady increase since um, uh, for the last year, 
um, and we're seeing about 25,000 new cards every day. Now, one of the impacts of this, um, my rather grey slide uh, demonstrates, is this slide is demonstrating ticket sales. So coming back to my original point about ticket sales, and we can see how from the beginning, as Oyster was introduced, ticket sales reduced down. They then leveled out at the level of journeys, and they've now started to dip down yet again. And you know, in fact, we're at the lowest level of ticket sales since the beginning of the last century. And this is important for us because stopping selling tickets um, is now saving us money. We no longer accept cash for buying tickets on buses. Uh, we've managed to close some of our ticket offices uh, and move those staff into front of house to interact with customers and offer a better customer experience. So this really has been a win-win in terms of a better experience of the customer, yet also saving us uh, costs. And I think that project was delivered over uh, a long period of time. We spent plenty of time thinking about it. Um, we did a lot of internal development. We worked heavily with Cubic, but we also worked with the payments card industry to a level where even we were changing some of their payment card rules. And that spirit of partnership is what led to the delivery of this service. And if I just talk about future challenges very quickly before I hand back to Boris um, from London, um, we've got to look at about how we provide better, more personalized information. You know, the aspiration is that if you see a little red marker on our app, you will read the message, you won't delete it, because that message will be specific to you. Um, I've commented already about new business models in terms of autonomous vehicles. How do we react to those? How are we going to incorporate them into our uh, network in London? Um, there are policy, regulatory, business issues, but equally I have a payment platform that might have a benefit to share that. Um, we're also in London um, acutely aware of the environment and the air quality in London and how to address that. And I think that is coming back to the challenges of congestion. And I'm afraid, like everybody on this call, I suspect, we are always being challenged to save money and do things uh, more cheaply uh, and sometimes even better. So I'll hand back to Boris now. Good. Thanks, Matthew. So you know, if you look at uh, two other projects, um, you know, um, chi Chicago, um, you know, certainly from Cubic's perspective, is a, a great example of a, a new style fare collection system that readies the city uh, yeah, for some of the challenges we talked about for the future. Yeah, uh, the first observation is it is a fully account-based, open payment capable uh, system. So yeah, the, the great advantage of that is that integrating additional modes of transportation yeah, becomes significantly easier as the reliance on dedicated and specialized um, contactless infrastructure uh, is reduced, uh, so integrating things like bike share systems over time and um, you know, providing more flexibility through things like mobile applications, mobile payments uh, becomes significantly easier. Yeah, similarly to London, uh, yeah, the project highlighted um, a need to do significant change management as new technology gets rolled out, um, as users need to act in, in, in different ways. Uh, but yeah, once you're through that, um, uh, it, it's vastly successful in terms of number of accounts that have been opened, um, yeah, number of active accounts, and yeah, uh, in recent years we then added um, also mobile, which also highlights a different way of integrating additional mode. So in the Chicago situation, when it first launched, um, yeah, we had the, the urban buses and urban rail system integrated in the Ventra uh, technology. And then through mobile, we brought in the uh, commuter rail um, infrastructure through barcode ticketing, but giving um, travelers the ability to pay for their commuter rail ticket through the Ventra account. So, uh, for example, if a user in the U.S. environment uh, had uh, yeah, pre-tax uh, transit uh, benefits deducted from their payroll and sitting in their venture account, 
uh, through the mobile application, they will be able to use those funds uh, to buy both commuter rail tickets as well as adding funds to their you know, inner urban uh, you know, Ventra uh, account. Uh, and so we see over time you know, different models of integration will emerge. Uh, some of them will involve using a single funding source, which in Cubic we call a one account solution uh, to pay for multiple modes. In other cases, additional modes will be integrated straight into the payment system um, you know, through the account-based uh, technology or pay-as-you-go approaches. Uh, Miami is a more recent project. So Miami has been a customer of uh, Cubic um, you know, for a long period of time. Uh, similar to other cities, um, they're looking at how do we uh, expand uh, the solution, how do we manage mobility in this changing environment. So um, they've decided to upgrade again to enable account-based and contactless uh, payment capability to introduce mobile. Uh, but now we are a couple of years later, so the new element in Miami is um, using the public cloud services, in this case Microsoft Azure, uh, to host the system. Uh, and and the, the primary business driver for that was to improve uh, scalability over time, uh, to make it easier to manage the data being generated by the systems and make it easier to uh, derive analytics uh, from that platform. So. Yeah, again, we see a, a theme of where cities are looking for flexibility in both the architecture and the infrastructure on which the solutions uh, get deployed. So I think you know, if we talk about you know, what do we see as the characteristics of a um, you know, future payment system that enables um, yeah, responsiveness uh, to uh, this changing uh, mobility environment. So. I think yeah, if you look at from the bottom of the slide, you know, the scalability and security, I think, have always been a, a key element, uh, but uh, the importance of being flexible to have the ability through secure APIs to integrate uh, new services, whether that's through the mobile app, as we've seen in Chicago, or directly into the uh, back office, uh, you know, is going to be critical. Um, the ability to interact with a fast-changing mobile environment is going to be a key uh, success criteria. So, um, you know, we see while we may not necessarily be able to predict exactly how the future will shape up, uh, we can take a lot of steps through how we design systems and deploy systems to enable that flexibility, and particularly if that gets coupled through uh, changes in procurement approaches, um, you were certainly confident that uh, the challenge of, of responding to this changing environment uh, can be met in a uh, cost-effective manner. So um, perhaps one other topic just to seed in that is, yeah, we talk a lot about uh, the benefits of uh, digital uh, models, um, and I think one of the challenges this raises is how to you know, create fairness uh, and social equity across all uh, user groups. Um, you know, Matthew talked about um, you know, capping uh, techniques as one of the ways to uh, give uh, people that prefer to pay or only have the ability to pay on a day-by-day -day basis the same discounts and fair benefits as somebody that traditionally perhaps got the discount for prepaying a weekly or, or monthly pass. Uh, but equally, um, yeah, we see there's a lot of potential, particular given account-based technology makes it easier to integrate third-party services to improve access uh, to underbanked and cash-preferred user groups uh, through expansion of retail uh, services uh, by integrating into existing uh, retail networks. Uh, so, for example, in in Sydney, uh, you know, we uh, integrated into a, a existing retail network, which removed the need for um, setting up a transit-only dedicated retail network and you know, simplifying that. Uh, and then, you know, particularly in a, in a U.S. environment, things like employer benefit schemes um, and also using mobile and um, you know, through things like virtual cards, um, I think creates opportunities to improve social equity. Likewise. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, integrating bike shares through the um, mobility uh, payment system provided by the city versus the need for uh, to utilize those systems, I think, creates new opportunities. 
So I think in summary, I think we, we recognize there's a fast changing environment. Um, you know, I think there's a strong desire to deliver new mobility experiences and I think a need in order to uh, manage uh, the, the challenges of uh, urbanization and congestion. Uh, and I think you know, uh, as a combination of technology and new policy approaches um, are needed to, to really be successful in, in dealing with that changes environment. So I think I'll probably leave it with that. Uh, perhaps invite Matthew uh, if he wants to say any closing remarks, but otherwise um, open up to questions. No, bring on the questions. Great. Thank you, you two. Um, we have a bunch of questions already coming in. Um, and if you guys, uh, audience, if you have questions, please enter them, type them into the questions panel in your control panel, um, and we will get to them. So, Matthew, a few questions about data. Um, what data does the City of London provide to the public? Um, how, does the, how does the public access that data for better services and also um, regarding data to enable entrepreneurs to create mobile apps. Do you want to just talk about your data policy and what, what strategy you guys have around that? Yeah, so I think there are two answers to this question. Um, uh, we have an open data policy in London whereby we've set up uh, the London data store um, and allow developers who uh, do have to sign an access agreement but it's uh, reasonably light to access that data. And we have found um, a number of apps being developed in London to help people maybe just with their bus journey or planning journey generally uh, or, or other aspects. So that's been um, a very positive thing for London um, that we've both encouraged developers uh, and we've made that data uh, available. Um, there is some data that we can't make available, um, things like people's customer accounts uh, on payment, et cetera, um, and that is where we have to provide customers with a clear service. So in terms of Oyster and Contactless, um, that data that we hold, customers have the ability to uh, could register with us or just log in um, for seven days' worth of data to be able to review their transactions. Great. Boris, any thoughts about successful data platforms you've seen or enabling open APIs for entrepreneurs or from Cubic's perspective? Um, yes, so uh, yeah, similar to London, I think we see a lot of our uh, cities taking similar approaches. Um, yeah, we see that one of the bigger challenges is particular the payment data on how to make that available in a way that doesn't compromise um, you know, privacy. Uh, but yeah, I talked earlier about um, creating APIs that enable the integration of third-party services. So you know, if we uh, look at cities like Sydney, you know, we're seeing a lot of good examples where um, APIs are being opened up for developers to create um, yeah, new services on open data, whether that's, uh, I think, at the moment, it's predominantly still around um, informational type data. So, you know, in the US, we um, you know, we provide a real time a service that generates real time predictions on bus arrivals on behalf of agencies. So that it's then made available through open APIs for developers to do things with. Uh, but even if you look at uh, projects like Chicago, you know, uh, there's a mix of um, both third party and cubic uh, technologies involved in the delivery of the overall services through that API based architecture. Great. Thank you for that. Um, a couple questions of whether the presentations will be available for later. The PDF is, a, is already available on the handouts panel, which is second to bottom in your control panel. It'll also be, it will also be available as well as the archive recording on our website at cityminded.org. You can find that. Um, couple questions about digital divide, which you touched on at the end there, Boris, but question for you, Matthew. What kind of issues have you guys encountered around the digital divide? Maybe tourists, low-income residents in London, children, um, kind of what percentage of low-income Londoners don't have access to a digital device that works with your services and kind of what have you guys seen in regards to strategies to deal with that? 
Yes, so we um, have almost made an assumption uh, and tested that out that our customers, um, both children, our regular customers, and our um, concessionary customers, um, do have access to the internet. So this was based on the fact that um, many libraries um, and public buildings offer internet access to residents. Um, so in that is our basis for um, almost allowing all to access their information um, via the digital channels. However, what we also do is run a call center. Uh, which I'm actually sitting in at the moment, which is a very large call centre of uh, 650 people. So we do have to provide the um, telephone uh, option for people to phone up and interrogate their accounts as well. So um, that's another important channel for serving our customers. And I think the final point is around giving information to staff so that people are able to approach staff um, mainly at stations and make queries um, and those staff have the ability also to interrogate a limited set of data to serve customers. That good. Boris, have you seen any great solutions for this in Miami or Chicago or other other cities? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably the first comment I'd say I think there's probably no 100% magic bullet to fully address it, but I think there's a lot of very successful techniques to minimize the digital divide. So I think one observation is that certainly uh, internet access and mobile phone ownership, particular smartphone, smartphone ownership, uh, I think across all demographics is increasing very fast. So I think the digital divide in terms of being able to access digital services is narrowing quickly. Uh, but uh, still a recognition that some customers may never be able to access those. So having a good channel mix uh, that includes yeah, a good retail network, particular in bus serviced areas, is critical. And again, yeah, account-based type technology makes that more cost effective to extend. Uh, having some, but probably reducing amount of uh, uh, things like ticket uh, uh, um, ticket vending machines or kiosk type technologies uh, is important. Uh, and the second one is you know, making sure that um, everybody's needs somehow can get addressed. So uh, as Matthew talked about, call center technology is still important and there's obviously some queries that require personal touch that need to get addressed. So the importance to us is always getting the mix right and making sure that uh, all user groups can be serviced in that way and, and narrowing the digital divide. And then obviously, I you know, talked a little bit about, um, and I, I think that's an area cities are still exploring, is how can you use uh, the public transportation payment system to make uh, services like bike shares traditionally only available through credit card ownership accessible to um, a broader set of the population. That's a great segue to our next question, which is, um, Matthew, when, um, Michaela is wondering, when will London include car share schemes in the public transport portfolio using a single card for all available modes, tube, bus, train, bike share, car share? Is that something you guys are thinking about? I'm glad I've been asked that question. Um, yeah. So we have been looking at this, and it's a very interesting space because um, many people will suggest um, why can't we use a single card, like an Oyster card, to access all modes of transport? And in fact, we examined that on our cycle hire scheme, which we run and own. But fundamentally, the costs of implementing the change were not worth the benefits. And when we look at things like car sharing, again, we have to be very clear what is the business or commercial model that underpins it. Because um, the issue, I think, in um, these new mobility uh, as a service, uh, mass as it's called, um, is it's clear that a customer would benefit having information about where services are, but the fully of linking together all account and payment brings huge commercial risks. So I feel sometimes uncomfortable about collecting money on behalf of another entity, and that other entity is possibly even more uncomfortable. 
because this is the lifeblood of their business. So when we look at this, we have to be very sure and clear what the commercial drivers are for this. Because in the end, if we are going to deliver a single app that links together all transport, it has to make commercial sense. And if it doesn't make commercial sense, maybe it's best for a customer to access two separate apps, one for its car sharing and one for doing its public transport. That isn't necessarily the worst position to be in. What we have to be clear is that there is definitely a benefit for Londoners and a benefit that's worth the expense that we would incur. Good. Great, great. I know a lot of cities are thinking about this as well. So, um, speaking of money, <laughs> I know a lot of, I've, I've been getting a bunch of emails in the last week about from transportation um, leaders in the U.S. who are thinking about creative financing solutions if um, federal transportation money goes away, including P3s and grants. And obviously, Transport for London has less of this issue to think about, um, but what kind of P3 models have you guys um, thought about or engaged in, and then um, is that something you guys have to worry about, or because of TFL's size, it's not something you have to worry about? And then the same question for you, Boris, after Matthew, is um, what P3s have you seen work in this space? So first to you, Matthew. So um, the history of London's transport is that we had um, a number of PPPs and PFIs that we had in this country forced upon us. So it was the uh, flavor of the day amongst uh, various previous governments. Um, and actually, we've had to unwind many of these um, private financing contracts because they just didn't work. And luckily, the creation of TFL, we've also had borrowing capacity so we can raise our own debt. And one of the issues that we found that I would share with everyone is that there are some uh, private finance initiatives that work, and those are the ones where predominantly all the risk is up front. So one of our light rail systems, um, a very clear PFI, whereby the private sector finances the building of a concrete trackway uh, and ensure it stays operational for 30 years. That for us was a PFI that could work. In the end, we still terminated these things early because we could refinance ourselves and make uh, have a better deal. The things that haven't worked so well uh, on a PFI basis are long-term contracts where there is continual change. So in a situation, I do not want to be tied up not only with a contracting party that delivers the service, but equally all the finances that are behind it. It makes change very, very difficult to deliver. So if we look at the history of the contract we use for fair collection, um, we had to enter into a, a PPP contract to start with in 1998. Um, we managed to get out of that contract at a halfway point, um, uh, not through some difficulty. We were then able, able to enter into a single contract uh, with Cubic Transportation, that had a better sharing of risk and reward, so we had better control, and we uh, were in control of the finances. So the experience from London, I'm afraid, has yeah. been rather mixed bag. Some has been good, but other has been not uh, to our liking. Great, and Boris, any thoughts? Yeah, I'll probably expand largely on the comment made, and uh, I think the first comment is there's not a lot of these type of contracts that we've seen in the fair collection space. Um, yeah, it's something that something we as a company uh, entertain uh, where it's the right solution for the client. Uh, but yeah, the, the key and you know, our limited experience of working on uh, contracts that have PPP aspects uh, to them is really getting the uh, uh, getting the correct alignment between you know, sources of risk and uh, sources of commercial reward um, and writing contracts in a way that they become responsive to change. And I think there's a lot of work that can still be done in that area. So you know, one good example is um, you know, if a contract doesn't properly align and deal with uh, changes in public policy in terms of impact on 
subcontractor or contractor costs, like for example, a change that would cause a significant increase in uh, customer service costs, uh, then that creates some unhealthy tensions that you know uh, get in the way of of, of really uh, working in a partnership with uh, the city to move the fair collection system forward. So, yeah. You know, so I think our summary kind of view is it, it is a tool that I think has a place, but um, you know there's a lot of work that feels like it still needs to be done to really get clarity and incorporate lessons around how to write contracts in a way that they work for the long term. Um, and so I kind of agree with Matthew that there's some pretty significant challenges that that need to be addressed when taking that kind of approach. Good. Um, great. Um, so this is a question for both of you from Kevin Chan. Um, was open payment released with an exclusive relationship with one credit card brand? And if so, what was the adoption rate during that period? Matthew, you want to talk about credit card brands and exclu exclusivity? Uh, yes, so we actually launched with um, both, uh, no, all three brands uh, in London, um, although I will let a secret out that during our negotiations to um, get the rule set changed for how cards operate, so there is a new global rule set for how contactless cards work in transport that we negotiated from London, um, we did have to threaten launching with only one scheme. Um, and that managed to get what we needed in our negotiations. So in the end, we launched with um, Visa, MasterCard, and American Express. Um, and again, there was no price differential between that and the Oyster. Uh, the take-up has purely been driven by the convenience factor. Great. And do you have an, any idea of how much um, the cost of selling tickets has been decreased with the new system? Do you have an, can you share that estimation? Uh, yes, so I didn't include the slide in this deck, but we've done an analysis of our cost of fare collection starting in 2007, uh, looking across all aspects of selling tickets, explaining tickets, uh, post-service uh, for customers, and it started at 14% in 2007. Um, it's now down to 8%, um, and that is a combination of many things, um, unpicking the contract, uh, doing things more efficiently, um, and introducing contactless. I would also say that in our assessment, contactless, we think has led to a 1% increase in revenue uh, in London, which in quite a saturated market for public transport uh, is also a good return. Great. And um, Boris, do you have any data for any other cities offhand, off the top of your head? Uh, London is really leading uh, on that front in terms of both its analysis and its visibility it has of its costs. So I think Matthew is probably the, the authority on the topic right now. I think the comment I'd make is, yeah, it, yeah, I, we really see and we obviously operate services on behalf of a lot of our customers, um, yeah, particularly the shift to digital and um, self-service um, yeah, has a big impact on um, service delivery costs while at the same time driving yeah, a better customer experience and, and better customer satisfaction. So I think it's a combination of all of the factors we talked about on the uh, webinar today in terms of technology shifts and new user experiences that can really help yeah, improve the overall net cost of uh, yeah, providing fair collection. Good. Um, question from Michael DeVito for you, Boris. Um, regarding the 90% closed loop in Chicago that you mentioned, is that a reflection of the convenience to customers or the fact that banks in the region have been issued dual interface cards? Do you want to just explain closed loop and dual interface in, um, in your answer? Yeah, great, great, great question. Um, so, yeah, when we talk about closed loop, yeah, we're really talking about uh, prepaid accounts where, um, you know, customers have funded a Ventra account with uh, funds or pre-purchased passes, and then use those uh, to travel, um, and 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 then identify themselves to the system, you know, using a uh, a Ventra card issued. Uh, one of the biggest drivers we see in terms of what's driving customers to choose one product or the other, uh, yes, somewhat is the availability of, you know, do you have a token and obviously contactless. 
bank card issuance in the US is significantly lower uh, versus the UK and Australia. Uh, but the other big factor is pricing uh, strategies. So um, you know, one of the differences between the UK environment, the London environment, and the US environment of Chicago is uh, you have uh, tax preferred um, or pre-tax uh, funding that people can use for public transportation. So that lends itself to a pre-funded closed loop uh, type uh, system. Um, and, and equally, you know, uh, there's still fare structures that you know, are more orientated towards passes versus capping type approaches that London has used. Um, so, yeah, many factors, but yeah, big factor is, is really the economics for the end user that drive what type of product is most appropriate to them. I think the convenience factor tends to be quite similar between the different products. Matthew, anything to add with that regarding TFL's perspective? Um, no, I think, I think Boris has hit on the difference in the U.S. market. Obviously, we are trying to almost guess how much contactless through the bank card of a mobile phone will penetrate the market. And um, I, I, we think it would could get to 80% of the market because the continual steady growth um, doesn't show any sign of abating. So there's no reason why we can't see many, many more people switching to contactless. But again, it's a different market to the U.S. Great. And question for you, Matthew, from Akmal Rafiq. Um, wondering if, if the tap to go is available on all London buses, and if so, what's the average cost to install, including the equipment for one bus? Any thoughts on that? Um, well, the, the answer is you can't equip one bus. It doesn't work like that, um, which I'm yeah. sure everyone recognizes. Um, I think one of the issues here about cost is that um, at the moment where the market is, is somewhere like London um, has the ability in the business case to invest in large back office systems um, and the front office readers and services to meet its needs. And we have driven that uh, very hard to deliver what we want. Now, I have a vision for the future whereby much of this back office processing which is the basis of the contactless payment card. Um, one doesn't have to be done in London, it can be done in the cloud, and could be done for many, many uh, cities. Um, but we're not there yet in terms of the business models being created such that that is being offered as a simple service whereby a authority enters its fares and somehow manages to link in its readers into that back office. Now, that may well come, um, but at the moment we're not there um, so when I look at my costs, I am looking at, yes, spending 20 odd million pounds building a back office, but I had a business case to achieve that. And we look at the cost of readers, we all know um, the number of readers needed out there and their servicing, you know, is a substantial cost. I think if we all collate around the EMV banking standard um, instead of some of the proprietary standards, we could end up with a more efficient market in terms of readers on buses and transmitting data back to a more centralized back office. But that's just my view of the future. Great. Um, great, great, perfect. Kitty Chu, I will take a couple more questions. Kitty Chu is asking, technology helps to enable integration of payment, but not necessarily fare. In many cities, there's a barrier to travel using multiple services because of this lack of fare integration, including public and private service providers. What advice? Matthew, can you give to cities that have not reached the same level of fare integration as London or coordinating between different services? So an honest opinion about integration of fares is um, don't do it. Um, and the reason I say mm -hmm. that is that it is so difficult because it is a commercial negotiation. And the only reason that London has uh, integrated fares across what is basically my tube and bus network and some of the national rail train companies is because once upon a time they were just two public bodies who for some reason did decide to come to a deal and work up how money would be allocated. I doubt in the current environment where there are 12 franchises let to private companies we would ever get fair integration with a third party. And I see it in other cities who are sometimes trying to pursue fair integration by saying that's not your answer. You know, if it costs so much for a bus and then so much for a taxi or a shared vehicle or whatever the answer is, 
let them just be two numbers that are added together um, because trying to create a standard on which all those numbers are calculated and revenue allocated and revenue collected and shared is a very difficult, tricky matter. In London, when I tried to extend our deal, um, it took me two and a half years of painful negotiation and we did sign the deal at the end and those two and a half years, the train company still generated 100 million pounds in the first year for their benefit, yet it took them two and a half years to sign up to the deal in the first place. Wow. Good, honest advice there. Boris, anything to add? Yeah, I'm probably at the risk of slightly contradicting Matthew, but I come from it from a slightly perhaps more academic kind of viewpoint, which is if I look at some of the challenges we talked about in the future in terms of yeah, integrating additional modes, optimizing uh, the transport network as a whole, um, you know, my and view is that requires uh, you know, uh, both a carrot and stick approach in terms of you know, creating the right economic incentives for people to behave a certain way. So a yeah, good example is if we want people to shift and leave their car at a you know, park to ride station and take a train into the city, yeah, one of the ways that behavior can be encouraged is to offer a integrated fare or that involves a discount for that behavior that reflects the overall economic uh, benefit that the city receives by improving traffic flow. Having said all that, I definitely agree with Matthew. It's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. You know, I think from a technology point of view, it's fairly straightforward. The technology is there, but you know, clearly the more parties you integrate to achieve those outcomes, the harder the commercial uh, dealings become. Uh, so that yeah, that gets somewhat out of my area of expertise in terms of where's the right balance in terms of how do you achieve those outcomes. Um, but I feel a level of integrated fares and particular incentives, people to change behaviors have a role to play, uh, certainly in some city environments. Great. The, the practitioner and the academic. <laughs> no. um, Perfect. Well, we're going to have to end with that last question. Um, there's some we didn't get to. I'm sorry for those people who, who are, whose questions weren't unanswered, but Boris uh, is always at all of our events. You can find him there, and Matthew and we'll get you at more of our events too now. Um, so a short survey will pop up when you close your browser. We really appreciate everyone's feedback, and we're always looking to improve our webinars, and we hope to see you at next month's webinar which will be listed on our calendar page of our website as well as on our blog. If you're interested in attending our Boston Mobility Summit in June, in um, June 20, Boris will be there. Um, please apply on our website at cityminded.org. We have a, bunch, a few public sector spots still available and some nonprofit spots. The private sector is pretty much full, but um, more information on all our events is available at cityminded.org. And that that concludes our session for today, Boris. Matthew, thank you so much for all of your thought leadership thank you. and best practices today. Yeah, our pleasure and thank you to the audience for some great questions that made it fun and interactive. So appreciate everybody. <laughs> yes, thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Talk soon. Thanks everybody.